Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. We have prepared for every presentation press text. So if you are interested in publishing one of the articles, please write to press at br-automation.com. If you should have any, information, uh, any questions during our presentations, please just type them into the chat. Before we start now with the presentations, I'd like to show you our agenda for today. We will start with a presentation from Stefan Jönecker, our marketing manager. He will give you a company update and an update on our product information roadmap. He will then hand over to Robert Kickinger, manager for Mechatronic Technologies here at BNR, and he will give you a preview on the biggest innovation in BNR history. Then Stefan Schönecker will take over again and he will talk about the BNR Edge architecture based on OPC UA TSN. And then we will have time to answer your questions. And now I'd like to give the floor to Stefan Schönecker. Thank you very much, Nicole, and very warm welcome to everyone who is with us here today. It's a pleasure to share with you some information about what's happening in our company and also to give an outlook on the, what we're doing on the product side and with respect to our innovations we're going to launch this year towards the end of the year and in the beginning of next year. I would like to start with a short recap of some truly exciting change that, uh, that has happened uh, within 2017. Earlier this year, exactly on April the 4th, we have announced that uh, ABB is willing to take over 100% of the shares of BNR. And on July the 6th, the closing has happened and this new combination is, was, made, um, was, was made true. Since that, we have a very intensive ongoing phase of integration activities, making sure that our both setups and both product strategies are well aligned and bringing us on the next level of innovation in the future of industrial automation. ABB consists of four major divisions and is structured in the topics of power grids, electrification products, robotics and motion, and which will be our new home, that's the industrial automation division. And within that industrial automation division, BNR will form a new global business unit for machine and factory automation. BNR continues dependent dedicated unit within the ABB group. We are considered a global business unit and with that also all uh, existing uh, BNR subsidiaries across the group continue to report to the BNR headquarter. Also the BNR management team continues um, in an unchanged way. That includes all our local management and of course also our managing director um, Hans Wimmer, uh, appointed CEO of the new organization. Peter Gucher, uh, the former sales director, who will be in the role of the CSO of this new group. And we're also very happy to welcome um, an, our new colleague, Clement Sagar, who was appointed the CFO of this new uh, business unit for machine and factory automation within the ABB group. I would like to point out here that we are very happy um, to summarize the feedback in a very positive way. So we have received feedback from our employees, but also from the customers and from the market in general. And, and the feedback was very, very positive and everyone uh, is looking in a very positive way into this new exciting future. What's also important to stress here is that our focus um, of, this new, um, of this new unit is clearly to further accelerate growth. And with that growth, obviously also we have to continue and even intensify our investments in our assets, in our machines, on our sites, uh, focusing of course on the also very much on the production sites of Eccelsberg and Gildenberg, which are going to be massively increased uh, and expanded uh, currently, but also looking uh, into the closer future. Above all, the most important aspect, that's what's 
the center of BNR, that's our history, but also that's our future. That's around perfection in automation, looking on our portfolio, looking on our products, looking on our innovation roadmap. And we are very glad to announce here that with uh, the upcoming show um, in, at the SPS IPC drives in Nuremberg, we are going to launch the biggest set of innovations we have ever shown before. And I would like to give you now a short outlook on what will be in, the, in this innovation basket at the show in Nuremberg. I'm starting with a very hardware-centric product um, that's around the mobile automation. And the mobile automation um, 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 system and platform was introduced already two years ago with a focus on, on mobile machinery, uh, including communal vehicles, uh, agricultural vehicles, and construction vehicles. And we launched the X90 platform uh, with that two years ago. What we are going to do now is to intensively expand the portfolio, first with a new set of decentralized I.O. Second, um, with a further element that's needed for uh, decentralization, uh, a so-called uh, distribution box, uh, a power link hub device. Third, we are going to bring a new vibration system, a very condition monitoring system, uh, very much uh, necessary for any kind of predictive maintenance approach. And last but not least, of course, uh, very important in that field uh, is the control or is the interface uh, to the engine units, uh, especially to the diesel engines, which we're going to solve with the J1939 solution that's going to be embedded in our platform. Nevertheless, as it is with all BNR solutions, the hardware is just one element of the solution. And of course, that's accompanied uh, with different uh, function blocks, libraries, and whatever is needed to really uh, get the development uh, um, to speed and uh, launch the products as quickly as possible. And I would like to draw your attention generally on the aspects of software because we truly believe in the fact that software is what makes the difference. And in our ecosystem, um, Automation Studio, but also Uproll, the map technology, but also our communication technologies like OPC UA, PowerLink and Open Safety, that's what's going to make the difference and that's also where we're going to even further intensify our investments. Having a, a deeper look on the map, what's map about? To summarize, it's to speed up development by, massively uh, by a massive reduction of complexity. With that, we give our customers the opportunity to focus on the core competencies and add value for the differentiation in order to be competitive on the global market. We started, or one of the, the first elements we have launched uh, around the map technology was the map view. The map view is a web-based visualization system, um, again, leveraging open architectures uh, like all the web technologies, but also for communication, the OPC way. And with that brings a very, very sophisticated, very modular um, and, and very easy to use uh, HTML5 based visualization concept. But that's just one part of the map family. Further parts include uh, things like map control, but also uh, the map safety and the map services aspects, for example, the map services to take care about alarm management or any other kind of diagnostics uh, approach. And last but not least, the, um, uh, technology functions around the map family, for example, the map web handling, uh, which for example can help with tension control system, register control, uh, the map temperature, very sophisticated uh, automatic tuning process uh, for temperature zoning, uh, the map hydraulics uh, for servo pump and valve based hydraulic system, and last but not least, the map control tools, uh, which is covering a wide range of features around a generic closed loop control environment. One more, and probably one of the most important aspects of MAP, that's around the mo motion technology. Historically, motion was one of really uh, a very sophisticated technology, but also that came along with a lot of complexity and a lot of work uh, to get sophisticated motion control solutions done within the machine equipment. With MAP technology, we simplified that process and, and made sure that, um, that the MAP motion uh, can be handled in a very easy and efficient way. 
Continuing with one more element, which is also very much about time to market, and that's around simulation. We are going to offer, and we are all, we have already started with that, and we are going uh, to expand our environment and capabilities around the simulation. And what we're going to showcase is a very efficient interface between Automation Studio, Automation Runtime, and a wide range of simulation tool architectures, including uh, the industrial physics from company Machineering, or virt virtuals from ISG, but also, uh, for example, interfaces to MapleSim, or also the MathWorks, uh, the Simulink environment. We are going to enable our customers to, in, in a very easy way, to show digital twins in real time on a fully virtualized platform. And that, again, helps to accelerate the development and the decommissioning of products and entire machine equipment. Last but not least, one more exciting topic, and that's about machine vision. And we are happy to announce here that BNR is uh, intensively um, ramping up activities in that field of machine vision and going uh, to, to invest in that aspect to again help to solve new challenges of machine equipment uh, that can rely on machine vision in a very well integrated, intuitive, but also synchronously connected to the general part of machine automation. And with that short uh, summary of some aspects of our innovation roadmap, I would like uh, to hand over to Robert Kickinger, who will in detail show one of our really, really exciting products we are going to launch at SPS. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And these are digital natives. They are online all the time and everywhere. And now you might be asking yourself, OK, but why is he showing this to us? The reason is the younger generation and the electronic gadget that they are growing up with are changing consumer behavior, are changing it in a forever way. What do I mean with that? Let's make a little thought experiment. Let's go out and have some fun with the family. We will get thirsty, and so we will configure a customized six-pack for us to take along. Two sprites for my kids, maybe two Fantas for your kids, a bottle of Coke for you, and a bottle of water for me. My daughter opens the online job and places the order. She can do that much faster than I can ever manage. And we will have the customized six-pack delivered to our home. And this brings us directly to today's topic, manufacturing technology for the economical implementation of mass customization, or technology that will enable the adaptive machine. We live in exciting times. On the demand side, we see dramatic changes in consumer behavior. And on the other, the emergence of powerful emerging new technologies. And it is this combination, this convergence, that opens up the new opportunities for innovation. And they just wait to be seized by OEMs and producers. The amazing potential that, that lies waiting to be tapped, it's the added value of personalization. Let's first take a look at the most important metrics we use to assess production efficiency. First of all, there's the return on investment. Return on investment measures the returns earned on a given investment in manufacturing assets, in this case. The most important factor besides purchasing costs and running costs is the productivity of the assets. Then the next metric is the overall equipment effectiveness. OEE is the product of how well a, a manufacturing unit performs relative to its designed capacity. During the most important issues with mass customization are to eliminate change over time for high quality, for, sorry, for high availability, and to implement a 100% quality approach. The next KPI is the time to market. 
which basically measures the time it takes to have a newly conceived product available for sale. Time to market is of particular significance for short-lived products and seasonal goods such as holiday-themed products. Now, we're getting to the really interesting part. What kind of technology do we need to make this happen? Manufacturing technology for the age of digitalization. Manufacturing technology that enables us to build the adaptive machine. The adaptive machine will be able to bundle or wrap custom combinations of individual products and it is able by doing so by merging product flows responsively in real time and at full speed. This raises availability to a level where even mass customization becomes attractive from an economic standpoint. But the adaptive machine not only converges product flows, it can also divide product flows. Think of a quality control station. Product is good, light turns green, and it carries on at full speed. Product is bad, light turns red, sort it out on the fly. And that's what the quality factor of OEE helps us to achieve. The adaptive machine is also fault tolerant. When you have parallel processing stations and one develops a fault, the machine is smart enough to simply cut off the feed to that station. This may throttle productivity a bit, but we are still producing at 100% quality. And quality issues like these inconsistent fill levels are a thing of the past. With a difference, that can be seen in the quality factor of OEE. The one technology with the greatest impact on time to market is simulation. That's true whether you're developing a new machine or setting up an existing line for new products. It's the best way to test and validate the results of your engineering. The adaptive machine is also scalable. It can grow with your production needs. You can start out with the basic configuration and enlarge it in a modular way. This increases your return on investment and is true investment security. These concepts are the keys to implementing mass customization in an economical way. And they are the recipe for converting the added value of personalized products into real bottom line growth. What we will be unveiling at this year's SPS IPC drives addresses each and every one of these aspects at a level of performance you won't find anywhere else on the market today. So I just can urge you, come to the fair, it will be very exciting. And with this, I'm going to hand over to Stefan. Thank you, Robert, for this exciting, you know, for intro uh, introducing to us this exciting innovation around the mechatronic solution. Now we're going to shift the focus again and from mechatronics we're going back the way to software. And with the BNR Edge architecture based on OPC UA TSN, needless to say we are touch basing the topic of the industrial internet of things. 
And with the Industrial Internet of Things, without now going into a, a long story of what it is and what it not is, I think there is consensus that it's a lot about connectivity, wired or wireless. It's a lot about data, data to be used and converted into useful information with any kind of demand for analytics and business intelligence. It's about, it's about cloud computing. It's about security. It's about data integrity. And it's, of course, very much also about new business models and with that, a convergence of IT and OT. But let's have a look on the term architecture. So when speaking about the edge architecture, obviously we need to see how it fits into an IoT architecture. And when looking into conventional industrial IoT architectures, we discovered um, that the consens among many of the proposals and different ideas of how an IoT architecture could be layered is around this four layer model, starting with the physical assets, going via the edge, the touch point between the assets and usually the cloud. But then there is something called the fog layer in between and last but not least, of course, the cloud layer. Comparing and matching that with actually our today's automation pyramid, we discovered that the differences are not that big. The cloud is the cloud. And looking on the automation pyramid, which again is a layered structure, you would find a one-to-one -one reference, for example, between the fog layer, and you can draw a direct line onto what we would do today in data centers using mechanisms of the cloud, using attributes of the cloud, and bringing them down on-prem. And going even below that, if you look on what's called the edge today, we could draw a line on what we would do today, for example, on the line layer, because that's usually the touch point uh, between IT and OT. And what is called the assets in the IoT world, that's where we are with the machines and with that, the sensors and actuators. What we see here is that BNR's aim always is towards simplicity, reducing complexity. And our approach for the architecture, for the industrial IoT architecture, is clearly going into reducing layers. And what we do is we are going to provide a very, very sophisticated edge layer that's actually able to cover the wide range from the cloud across the entire site and down to the physical sensors and actuators. That's what we are going to call the edge layer, but that's embedding, of course, also lots of fog capabilities and capabilities you would see today in modern virtualized data center environments. Let's start with a first look on the data sources. So what's, what's that about? What kind of information is transmitted from the data sources to the edge, and how do we do that? We start with a look into a cabinet, a typical cabinet that could be used for any kind of modern production machine. And we are going, or we are already able to offer a very wide range of modules and hardware that's able to basically collect the information and collect all the information needed that we need in the edge layer uh, for any kind of compute purpose. Starting with energy monitoring, but also of course vibration monitoring, important for any kind of preventive uh, maintenance application. Uh, any kind of digital drive information that's coming with several drives, but also with any kind of inverter drives. Temperature, still a very important um, element that has to be measured. And of course, also we have to offer, and we do offer a way uh, to securely connect and transmit that information to the edge or even to the cloud. And now coming to the edge architecture, connecting and combining the sources of information with the cloud and adding value in between. We are going to offer three different, um, t three different ways and three different architectures. Uh, each exactly matching the needs of the topology that's used in that certain application. Starting with a very simple one where the sensor and actuate information might be directly connected to the cloud. 
In that aspect, obviously, something different is needed on the edge layer than it would be when having a full automated uh, production machine, which again uh, might have the need to exchange and transmit data to the cloud and with the cloud. And last but not least, even of course, obviously, there is a difference um, compared to, to the machine level edge architecture when having an entire plant to be uh, automated with an edge based architecture. And again, obviously, there will be a need uh, to exchange information with the cloud. And we are going to fill in those three architectures a wide range of portfolio and different hardware types that are exactly going to match the needs. On the Edge Connect, of course, a very simplified version of an Edge solution with the Edge embedded, already bringing more processing power, more horsepower for computation and more sophisticated functionality, and the Edge controller already ranging very far uh, above and reaching into the data center environments. But that's just the hardware side of things. And when speaking about the Edge or the IoT architectures, of course, it's very much about software. And software, and I'm going uh, to repeat myself here, is going what makes the difference. Now let's look on the software side of things within an edge architecture. Obviously, the hardware requirements and the value that's generated is also increasing uh, with the complexity and, of course, also with the value we are going and the, the functionality we are going to edge in that environment. Starting with control, that's what we already do today, but that's also going to be an element of any kind of edge platform. I'm not going to go in, in detail here, um, but what's already a very interesting aspect is the term and is the topic around security. So far, security usually was done with a, with a big separate, or with a, with a clear separation, um, a separation of interests, but also a separation um, of domains and with that bringing security just on a certain touch point. What we are going to see in the future is that security has to become a core part of, of each and every unit in a factory, and that's of course also something we're going to address with our Edge portfolio. Connectivity, again, um, that's th a very obvious element, and connectivity is something that has to be part of every Edge and IoT architecture. Very interesting is the function of data aggregation. Data, everyone uh, is, is well uh, familiar with the term big data, and very often big data is also considered the big data problem. And why is it a problem? Because the, the, sheer, the, the massive amount of data that's going to be produced by all the various sensors, that's really, uh, on the one side, bringing opportunity in the value it can provide, but also bringing the challenge on how to aggregate the data and how to really make sure only useful and, and relevant data is going to be processed. That's what's about data aggregation. Producing data obviously also means storing data. And just think about track and trace applications, which is going to be a standard in many industries. And let it be for legal aspects, for legal requirements, as we would have it in the, um, in the pharmaceutical industry, for example, but also in any kind of medical, um, uh, in any kind of medical plant. But th that's also a question of costs. And with that, data historian will also become a key element of any future edge architecture. And when having the data reduced, condensed, and stored, then the big question comes, how to convert data into relevant and useful and human readable information? And that's where the business intelligence comes into the game. And that's obviously also one of the important aspects we are going to address with our edge architecture. Machine learning, another very fancy and new term that came up. And it's not just something which is about artificial intelligence, far in the future, science fiction. Machine learning has started, machine learning is there, and machine learning will start in steps. One, let's say, very first step of machine learning can be around predictive maintenance, but obviously there is a lot more to come, and also, of course, that's an important uh, part of our future investments in the field of edge and IoT architectures. And last but not least, 
The long-term storage of data is also important to have that, and that's uh, a very obvious, uh, a key element of what can be done in the cloud. Let's have now a look on how we match our different products and platforms and families with the functionality we are going to address with the entire architecture. And in, we start with the Edge Connect, as we said. That's the f really the, the first step into Edge environments and Edge applications. And uh, here we see that the Edge Connect just covers the first three layers. So it's a very thin layer, what we would do at the Edge. It's, it's about control, it's about security, and it's about connectivity. So for example, this device will already be able to provide a direct connectivity to the cloud, whereas the other elements of data processing of data historians of business intelligence with that device alone would then be um, done within the cloud environment. Interesting here is um, that this already provides a full featured R2 discovery mechanism, meaning also that on the cloud layer it doesn't need to be known before of what kind of data it's connected to and what kind of sensor information it will provide. That's done by the module itself. Jumping into the second category, the Edge Embedded. The Edge Embedded already provides much more capabilities around Edge on what was able with the Edge Connect. And the Edge Embedded provides already a very easy way of data aggregation, uh, all based on um, an extension of our MAP framework. Also, the Edge Embedded architecture provides the capabilities to, provide, uh, to have a direct access to database systems. And it provides an embedded security mechanism using full-featured OPC UA communication principles. One very specific element of the Edge Embedded solution is our orange box solution, what we introduced already last year. The orange box is a very focused uh, Edge Embedded solution with the target of connecting Brownfield meaning systems and assets that have already been in place and that have been installed, uh, some of them many, many years or even decades ago, but still allowing them to be connected, to be upgraded, and to add um, a lot of additional functionality on those formerly unconnected assets. Last but not least, the Edge Controller. That's a full-featured IoT Edge platform. The Edge Controller even has an embedded, redundant, high-performance database system and provides a very, very comprehensive set of libraries and functions around analytics, around trend, and around um, reporting and business intelligence algorithms. It also has an inbuilt asset management software, which allows a, a very easy deployment of software, but also management of software uh, along the entire lifecycle of the equipment that has been installed. When talking about edge architectures, IoT architectures, again, communication is, is absolutely the fundamental baseline. Without connectivity, um, neither edge to edge nor edge to cloud communication would be feasible. And what we are going to do here is what I'm showing you next. Let's come back to the picture of the different elements you would find in a factory. We have the machines, we have the sensors and actuators, we have the robots, and we have generally all the assets that have been installed in the plant. And we need to connect them with the cloud, where our approach is, of course, a very cloud agnostic approach or a supply agnostic approach. So we are going to be, we want to be able to connect to each and every cloud and cloud provider that's out there. And we also want to connect the very physical elements to any kind of fork and edge computing architecture that could, for example, be installed on-premise. And the functionality we are going to achieve is what we have just addressed before. It's, it's the machine learning, it's the business intelligence, uh, business intelligence, or things that I've not mentioned before, HEV guidance, uh, but also very traditional functions like SCADA systems, but ERP, ERP services or MES services. And the question that came up was, how do we build the bridge? How do we build the bridge between the elements and the things? And how do we build the bridge to the cloud or fog or edge layer? 
And the answer here is we are going to use the most sophisticated standards-based communication architecture around OPC UA and extending that with TSN for edge-to-edge -edge real time communication and with broker services such as AMQP and MQTT. Why did we choose OPC UA? And why are we so convinced that OPC UA is what will make the difference in any kind of IoT and edge environment? Well, first, I mentioned that it's 100% based. It's based on open standards. But also, it's a cross-industry standard. So it's not any kind of niche technology that has been implied by some very specific verticals in that world. It's a global standard, that, and there is a global acknowledgement both among vendors but also among customers, end users, plant manufacturers, machine builders that, that, that want to make sure that OPC UA is really the one and only open architecture they are going to use in their IoT environment. Also what we see is that already by 2018, OPC UA is what will have and provide the biggest ecosystem in the world of industrial communications out in any kind of manufacturing environment. And last but not least, security is what it brings and what many of the legacy systems that are out there uh, could not resolve in the last years. With OPC UA, it's clear. That, that's a clear bet and that's an easy win. The question is why TSN and why are we so convinced that TSN is the right choice even out there are lots of rumors that TSN has not, been, um, has not been delivered, TSN is still in the standardization process, so how can, we so, uh, how can we be so sure that TSN is what will solve our challenges already in the upcoming year 2018? And my answer is very simple, that TSN is here now. All the core standard needed for sophisticated IoT and edge architectures have been completed and they are ready to be used. And I would have a short look on some technical details of TSN uh, and to show which of the standards we're speaking about and which of the standards we are considering crucial, but also sufficient to be used for this kind of application. We start with the same architecture we've shown before, using a central net a network orchestration and starting with the first element of TSN, that's time synchronization. And with the standard 802.1 AS, we have resolved that. And that's a stable standard, and that's ready to be used. And with that, we get a absolutely high accuracy, precise, and equal time-based across every sensor and actuator and machine and device that's out there in the factory. Second, the question comes, how do we configure all those elements? How do we configure all the different devices, but also the infrastructure components, for example, all the switches that we are going to use? Well, again, here is the standard. It's called QCC. There is a protocol of choice called NetConf, and that's mature, that's ready, and we are happy to release products based on those standards in the upcoming year. And last but not least, how do we assure um, high performance, deterministic data transmission. And that's where the standards QBV and QAV come into the game. These two standards, again, they are mature, they are completed, and they are already out in silicon, and they are ready to be used to assure a deterministic exchange of data between all the components in a plant. To summarize, the BNR Edge architecture on the one side is based on a full family of hardware environments combined with very, very sophisticated and advanced software processing and edge capabilities. And again, all that based on open standards and we are going to use OPC UA and TSN and for cloud connectivity, AMQP and MQTT. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. We are now going to conclude that session and we are finishing and we're, um, with the Q&A session together with Nicole. So far, so far we got one question 
um, about if we are rebranding the orange box. And this question was put in the chat uh, while you were presenting the edge architecture, but before you presented the orange box. But maybe you can point out one more time how the orange box fits into the edge architecture by BNR. Well, thank you for that question. So the orange box is one very much optimized um, interpretation or version of the edge embedded solution. So the orange box is based on the edge embedded functionality and ecosystem. And it's designed and tuned to, in the best way, cover the need of brownfield connectivity. So the orange box is based and was actually the first product based on our edge <laughs> architecture. So at the moment, we do not have any more questions in the chat. So uh, if any questions should arise, please, as I mentioned before, uh, send us an email to press at br-automation.com. Um, also, if you are interested in the press text, then you can send an email too, and we will send the articles to you. And for now, thank you for your attention. And all of us is hoping to see you at our booth in Nuremberg uh, end of November during the SPS IPC Drive show. Thank bye you bye. very much. Thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to see you again soon. Bye-bye.